Well, hello everyone. I hope all of you are well, uh, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Pradeep, um, and welcome to the next exciting segment of Gem Pharma Tech's webinar. And uh, today we have a very special treat. We have our Chief Technological Officer, Jing, um, going to talk about germ free models and their application and the huge portfolio here at Gem Pharma Tech we offer our customers in terms of germ free mice. So a bit of uh, a detail about Gem Pharma Tech. We're a one-stop solution for all your mouse needs, particularly if you're based in the academia industry. We do a lot of preclinical work and research. We have huge platforms to make conditional knockouts, humanized mice, supplying NCG mice for immunodeficiency studies. We also do disease models. You name it, we do it, and we're here to help you. And as I mentioned, one of our big, biggest platforms available globally is our germ-free and microbiome research platform. Um, so Jay is gonna talk about um, this platform now. Just before I do, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, Jing actually uh, read her undergraduate in the School of Life Sciences at Beijing University. Um, her thesis and much of her focus was in biotechnology, concentrated on biochemistry and molecular biology. She was an outstanding student and for her efforts, she got a PhD scholarship in molecular and cell biology at Harvard University. And in America, she flourished in looking at synaptic transmission and vesicle recycling for a PhD. Then she moved to New York to the Rockefeller University where she concentrated on leptin signaling in the brain um, for her postdoc. And then she moved to Taconic for three years, uh, heading some of their um, technological services, technical services. And then we we're very lucky and fortunate enough for her to join us here at Gem Pharma Tech. So that's Jing for you. Um, Dr. Lee, the stage is yours. And please tell us more about um, germ-free mice and their application. Thanks again for joining us. And uh, I'll take this time to uh, introduce our germ-free platform, uh, including mouse models, as well as services to you. And um, you know, looking forward to working with you, um, serving your research needs. So today, um, I will um, uh, go through three parts. Um, the first one is to have a brief introduction about the germ-free and um, germ-free mice for biomedical research. And the second part is um, how we can use germ-free technology as well as animals for the research that we need to do. And finally, I'll introduce to you the mouse models and services that are available at um, Gemma Pharmatech. So as I said, a brief um, intro about uh, the germ-free um, animals. So it wasn't until 1895 uh, that um, uh, the first um, germ-free guinea pig was available, um, made available by Natal and uh, Theo Felder. And then it wasn't until next 50 years until we have um, the germ-free rats and mice in the 1950s and uh, close to 96, the 1960s. And uh, after that, um, a lot of um, active investigation has been put into um, generating germ-free animals for research purposes. Um, and then in recent um, 15 to 20 years, we have seen an increase of uh, germ-free or about uh, microbiome study uh, in life sciences. However, you know, looking at the history, I realized there's one thing um, that was quite interesting for me to learn, which is it was actually 10 years before the guinea pig was uh, generated. It was uh, Louis Pasteur who actually introduced the first, uh, first time the concept of generating a animal that are free of common microorganisms for the study and understanding of host and the microbe uh, relationship. So that was quite um, um, stimulating uh, scientifically for me to learn. So uh, germ-free, as we talk about, you know, control of uh, microbes, uh, that's basically a microbial containment requirement. And uh, in, um, in doing so, there has been a few different 
um, levels of containment, starting from the conventional, which is open cage, and there is no screening or exclusion of microbes. And secondly, is the um, very commonly known specific pathogen-free condition. So these are the animals housed in hyperfiltered uh, hyper cage, and they have uh, excluded, excluded certain um, pathological pathogens. The next level is the notobiotic animals. Uh, these are animals also uh, live in hyperfiltered cages and probably germ-free isolators as well. Um, what their microbial composition is uh, very well defined and every microbe in their body is known. And the highest level or the most restrictive level is the um, germ-free uh, containment where a special um, equipment, uh, typically the double airlocked and the hyperfiltered isolator is required. And uh, these mice are living under a septic condition. They are um, uh, free of any microorganisms in their environment as well as within their body. So at Germ Pharmatech, we practice uh, three of the contain about microbial containment. Uh, the first one is the SPF. We have uh, up to date about, about 150,000 cages capacity um, uh, raising um, animals, um, in particular mice for research purposes. We also have a notobiotic and germ-free uh, facility. At the moment, our capacity is at, is at about 1,300 uh, cages in isolator facilities. And here, just a brief um, is a picture to show you how we uh, designed our germ-free uh, facility and the, the type of isolators and the room layouts uh, for your information. Now, talking about containment, the first thing we need to do is um, using sterilization techniques to make sure the environment or the equipment uh, tools that we use are up to the level of the containment. So in our germ-free facility, we use uh, different uh, type of material uh, in the tools and equipments. We have uh, corresponding uh, steriliz sterilization uh, methods uh, for cleaning up those equipments and tools. And in the few pictures I showed here are the uh, chemical as well as biological indicators uh, for us to verify that the sterilization methods actually worked and we are achieving what we're looking uh, to achieve in terms of containment. Um, well, once we um, cleaned our tools and um, the environment, uh, we raise animals in these uh, facilities, uh, we need to do testing in order to make sure the animals are what they are supposed to be in terms of um, uh, micro microbial burden. So in our hands, we do three types of um, uh, testing. The first one is uh, microbiological cultures. This is a, um, very easy to understand. Um, the first set of pictures are showing you a typical way of doing gram um, positive, positive or negative staining um, in the culture smears. And uh, I do want to emphasize that we pay attention to aerobic microbes as well as anaerobic Microbe microbes, we, um, we use um, the anaerobic uh, culture uh, like this to make sure <clears throat> we, can, um, we can culture these microbes as well as detecting them when we do the testing. And uh, the second method is uh, using micro uh, molecular biology, uh, doing uh, PCR on 16S RNA uh, from the uh, micro uh, from the microbes. And finally, we also do visual inspection for parasites uh, from the body uh, and tissue of the mice. Um, since our um, parent company is in China, I do want to, want to introduce this concept, which is uh, nationally, our company has to comply to a national standard in terms of um, um, microbial containment as well as testing. A screenshot of the document is here, um, just so that you are aware. And uh, according to this standard, we have a uh, list of microbes, um, including bacteria, viruses, and parasites 
we have to test in order to comply to the standard. Um, in this uh, slide, you can see these uh, microbes that I uh, are um, having those black dots. They are the microbes that we have to test according to the national standard. These are uh, required um, tests we have to do. And then these microbes with open um, circles, they are optional given this national standard. We do these for our customers if required by the customer. And finally, these red highlights, they are not part of the national standard. However, we do have um, our internal uh, uh, testing lab, which are capable of detecting them. And we do those services uh, if we receive requirements from our customer. So uh, as a step further, uh, we do care about uh, the animals and uh, we care about their quality as well as um, their well-being. So in order to do that, we um, have uh, applied to the I-Class uh, certification uh, from I-Class and we have passed the certification evaluation two times uh, so far in 2014 and 17. Uh, since 2015, we have um, um, acquired this aggregation up to now. Now, I want to spend a little time to um, uh, talk about the germ-free mice. And uh, this is a, a, a slide which shows a general um, knowledge that we have gained, not just we at Gem Pharmatech, but the science community have gained um, in studying germ-free animals. So um, they are different from a normal mouse. Uh, and then they their differences are quite um, uh, profound if we take uh, a closer look. However, on the outside, they look just like a mouse. Um, so when we look at them, uh, I listed out a few um, uh, systems uh, of the mouse that you can, you know, the difference between a germ-free versus a, a typical or SPF mouse can be discerned quite readily. Um, in the in the circulate in the vasculature system, the, their heart is smaller than a regular mouse, and this translates to they have a, a lower uh, cardiac output, which is about one third reduced compared to a normal mouse. They also have uh, reduced blood flow and volume, as well as some um, parameters such as, you know, increase in red blood cells or the hematocris in the body. Um, in addition, actually, when you examine a germ-free mouse, the uh, most profound feature is the enlarged cecum that you will see, which is shown in this second picture. This is um, mostly due to a reduced uh, degradation of mucus on the inner surface of the cecum of the animal. And in the same time, there are many other morphological changes um, taking place in the GI tract, um, including you know, the wall of the intestine is um, thinner and their, uh, their, the villi uh, lining up the small intestine is also uh, longer. Uh, in addition to the crypts. The immune system has been under a uh, very active um, investigation because um, in more recent years, um, as cancer become a, a common phenomenon uh, for human health uh, concerns, um, um, the immune um, inter and the interaction between the immune system with the microbiome has been um, has become a very hot topic. Here, I just listed a few um, bullet points uh, for our uh, for the introduction of our uh, discussion later on. Um, it, at a gross morphology level, a lot of um, organ structures are different um, between a germ-free mice versus a normal mice. And uh, I'll talk a bit more later uh, what other aspects we have where scientists has investigated uh, when looking into the microbiome uh, with the immune uh, function. So in addition to those three systems, um, we also know that um, metabolism as well as reproduction, reproduction has been different in the germ-free mice. Uh, I won't belabor too much here. Um, 
but overall they are um, they have kind of like a lean uh, phenotype because they have reduced body mass um, and as well as a, a decreased metabolic rate. And in terms of reproduction, their females has a longer uh, estrus cycle. And this partially uh, leads to the fact that uh, there are few pups born per female. Um, and lastly, but not least, um, there has also been uh, active investigation uh, between the microbiome and the nervous, uh, central nervous system. So many questions remain in this area in terms of you know, how the microbiota um, actually uh, play, uh, having an effect on the brain mythology as well as cognition. How will that affect the processing of salient versus hedonic signals, as well as you know, the pathophysiology of neurodegenerative diseases such as um, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Now, I want to show you um, some data from our, our own um, um, raising and uh, producing the germ-free mice. So Gemma Pharmatech started to um, investigate um, into the germ-free platform at the beginning of 2018. And by the beginning of 2020, uh, we started to produce germ-free mice in large quantity. And then um, second, during the second half of 2020, uh, we start to serve our customers with germ-free mice. So giving you this uh, brief intro, you know, we have been spent quite some time, however, compared to uh, other uh, vendors, we are, um, we are relatively new uh, to this market. And, but at the same time, we are actively accumulating data from the mice, from the germ-free mice that uh, we are producing in our colonies. So in this uh, slide, I'm showing you, um, we looked at um, the, at the growth level, how a germ-free mice is different from the uh, mouse that raised in the SPF condition. These are males uh, at eight week of age. So um, this is the organ weight among these uh, two groups. As you can tell, other than the cecum, where the GF mice has a much bigger and heavier cecum, there all the other organs are actually lighter than the SPF uh, counterpart. This is not only true for the absolute uh, weight measurement, but also when it's normalized to the body weight. And here we look into the uh, blood chemistry as well as hematology between the two groups. So far, we haven't seen anything uh, remar remarkable or jumping out uh, in front of our eyes. Um, I want to introduce this uh, product to you. This is our germ-free, um, severe immune deficient uh, mouse model. And these are um, pretty new in our pipeline. Um, and the, the data here is uh, comparing actually the males versus females. Uh, at eight weeks of age within this, um, this cohort. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, a normal B6 mice or a no normal uh, mouse, um, mouse lines, the female and male are showing sexual dimorphism in many aspects. And uh, similarly, these germ-free uh, immune deficient mice also show a similar um, uh, difference between the two sexes. And uh, we also look into the blood chemistry and the hematology. Uh, and again, um, so far we haven't seen anything uh, remarkably different uh, between the two groups in comparison to um, SPF uh, uh, female versus male. Now I want to um, introduce, well use uh, a few references to introduce to you um, how germ-free animals has been used uh, for the biomedical research and uh, why uh, we think it's important um, to use them as a tool uh, for the research. Um, this one is, a, um, is taken from a 2016 um, publication which summarized how the research field has been, has been responding to um, using germ-free animals as a research tool. So 
um, parallel to the generation of the first uh, germ-free rats and mice, as you can see, publication increased um, very rapidly in the next 10 to 15 years. And somehow in the mid 1970, it reached a plateau and come down a bit and remained as a, a steady state until very recently past uh, 2005, where the research using germ-free animals picked up again and which keeps going until um, this day. And uh, in the next few slices, I'll uh, introduce, I'll use, uh, I'll describe a few um, papers that are looking at the interaction between the gut microbiota versus the immune system and how that um, uh, microbiome um, affect the immune therapy, in particular, a paper uh, looking into uh, melanoma patients on um, PD-1 therapy, and also um, some interesting data from uh, microbiome versus metabolic regulation. And uh, lastly, I will um, describe a paper which looked into how the microbiome is um, interacting with the CNS and in particular in the context of um, Parkinson's diseases. Now, the first one, um, this is a review paper, uh, which in my opinion is very informative. Uh, in this particular paper, it was looking at um, what if um, an animal, either a human or a mouse, doesn't have microbiome to start with and how the body will respond um, to this condition. Um, this is an um, uh, accumulation of a lot of studies in the field. And uh, generally speaking, when uh, here as an example from the um, uh, um, colitis. So in this particular example, um, people know that the invariant NKT cells are actually uh, playing a role in conveying the susceptibility to colitis as animals age into adult life. So in the absence of microbiome, animals are developing colitis. And uh, however, if these are, if microbiome in is introduced to the animal, they are rescued and they are able to develop, develop a healthy colon. And this can be done by either an introduction of a community of micro microbes or a specific uh, microbial species, which is quite remarkable. In this paper, since it's talking about development, also introduced a um, uh, concept, which is not new anymore to, uh, to us today. And that is the introduction of this uh, microbiome in order to, to convey a healthy um, uh, situation or healthy immune function. Um, there is a critical window, uh, which is called the window of opportunity. So if the microbiome is introduced late compared to the window, the animal will still develop colitis. However, if the introduction is early during the development, the animal will be able to um, avoid uh, developing colitis later in life. And the same thing uh, is true with a particular example from the skin where the T-Rex cells are uh, playing an important role to, um, to be educated by the microbiome in terms of um, commensal antigens. So if these animals or the, if these T-Rex are exposed to a commensal antigen, which later on will be exposed to uh, from the environment, the T-Rex will be educated and then be able to um, convey tolerance in the adult animal. However, if they are not exposed early enough to the antigen, later on, these animals will be susceptible to develop inflammation on the skin, uh, which is um, eczema or psoriasis uh, among human patients. And the same thing is actually true uh, among the B cells as well. Here is an example from the IgE production. I won't belabor into the details, but the, um, the essence here is that um, exposure to microbiome early on will be able to keep the IgE production in check so that um, there is no chance for uh, anaphylaxia or anaphylaxis to develop in adult human being, which is a critical or life-threatening 
um, condition among people who have allergies. Um, however, if either the um, microbiome is not introduced or is introduced as a low quantity, um, the, the immune system may respond by a hyperactive IgE production, which will um, um, bring a higher risk for people to develop this life-threatening condition. And then the second paper is an interesting thing. Um, so from the first review, we look at how the microbiome uh, or how the immune system will respond to the presence or absence of microbiota. In this particular paper, it was looking at the interaction in the other way around, which is the presence or absence of um, immune components. How will that shape the microbiota that will be lining up on the gut? So in this particular um, instance, um, what uh, is the researchers looked at is they're using the RAG1 mutant mouse. These are mice that have defects in their adaptive immune system. They don't have C4 positive cells. And so these animals, they have accumulation or increased microbiota uh, burden in their gut, as you can see from these plots. And this one is plotting the total micro, uh, microbial uh, burden in the mouse versus there are certain species shown uh, from the same um, publication. And then when the, um, uh, when the RAG1 mutant mice was uh, made to be deficient on IL-23 production, which is a activation signal for a particular, uh, a particular group of innate lymphoid cells, the group three in particular, um, there are even more um, microbial burden on the gut. So this um, in combination is suggesting the absence of certain uh, immune components will be able to um, lead to changes in the microbiota. And in a reverse way, uh, in a healthy or immune competent animal, these animals will have um, a um, regulated level of L23 activation, meaning the innate immune system in, is in check, which will keep the burden in check. And then during development, the CD3, uh, CD4 positive cells will come along slightly later than the L23 uh, uh, activation, which will keep the microbial burden in check continuously so that a animal, a, a healthy animal will never have a increased uh, microbiota in the gut. I know I'm going to switch a little bit to the um, immune therapy um, scenario I described a little earlier. So in this um, paper, um, the researchers are in particularly interested in how microbiome will influence the effect or responsiveness of a PD-1 immunotherapy. So what they did is they have um, patients treated with a PD-1 immunotherapy and they looked into their microbiota. These are patients who are who have melanoma on their skin. Um, so what the researchers found is that um, among the patients, uh, microbiota from responding patients versus non-responders, um, they can see a significant difference in terms of the composition of the microbiome between these two groups of patients. And uh, when they um, transplant the uh, microbiota from the responders versus non-responders to the germ-free mice, they can see only the microbiota from the responding patients can um, convey a anti tumor immunity uh, to the mice that are bearing um, tumor. In parallel, they also used antibiotic treated mice, uh, which are transplanted with those two groups of uh, microbiota. And again, these uh, antibiotic treated mice, when they receive the microbiota from the responder patients, they, ha they have a higher anti-tumor immunity. Uh, which leads to reduction of tumor size. 
And finally, a very interesting uh, observation uh, the, the researchers did, which is they take up uh, this particular microbe that is uh, enriched in the responding patients and uh, uh, supplemented this uh, microbe into the germ-free animal. And they can see this uh, rescues uh, the mice uh, who are receiving the non-responding uh, microbiota in terms of anti-tumor immunity. Um, so this is a very interesting um, paper. I think it will you know, um, give us a lot of th to think about how we can utilize microbiome as a tool um, to um, uh, enhance uh, the therapy that we are using to treat patients. So I'm switching again to look at microbiome versus um, metabolic regulation. And this is a very interesting um, paper where the authors were able to identify twins who are discordant in terms of uh, metabolic parameters such as um, body mass index or fat mass uh, or body weight. So it's rare to find, to find these patients um, uh, um, because obesity similar to uh, height is actually a very genetically regulated um, uh, phenotype among humans as well as mice and other uh, mammals. So they were able to find four pairs of such twins. And um, they did an interesting uh, experiments where they look at the microbiome between the obese twin versus the lean twin. And they also transplanted these microbiota to a uh, germ-free animal. So these are animals receiving the obese uh, microbiota and mice receiving the lean microbiota. Interestingly, the animal receiving the obese microbiota actually become overweight or obese as well. And next, um, they did a co-housing experiment. Um, the two groups are still receiving the obese microbiota or the lean microbiota. However, uh, after a few days for the microbiota to uh, replenish the germ-free uh, animals, they co-housed these two groups together. In this uh, co-housing uh, scenario, the mice uh, that are receiving the obese microbiota were able to not to put on weight as much um, because um, it was shown by the research that their gut is invaded by the lean microbiota. At the same time, the reverse didn't happen. So the obese microbiota was not able to make the animals receiving the lean microbiota to become more obese. So this is a very intriguing uh, result. And they showed um, to this uh, rescue experiment um, that this is a dependent on the diet. So if the mice are fed on a high fat diet, um, they, do, they, they couldn't see the rescue of the obese phenotype. However, if the mice are given a low fat child diet, which has a higher uh, veggie and um, protein composition, they were able to reduce um, the obesity uh, among the mice. And now the, the graph on the right side, just to show you one more time, which is no, no surprising until this point that the obese mice, they have certain uh, microbiota composition, which is signature for the obese microbiota versus this group is a signature for the lean microbiota. And now switching gear a little bit again, um, looking at um, a, um, a very relevant metabolic condition, the type two diabetes. Um, type, type two bi diabetes has become so prevalent among human population, it become uh, a very big concern for health uh, care system, not just treatment, but also you know, keeping um, the entire system in check uh, so that we can still afford uh, the treatment and, um, and be able to manage, uh, to manage it well. So what um, this paper did is um, simple but interesting. Metformin has been used for treating type two diabetes um, for a long time, quite a few years. And um, people do know uh, the effect of metformin is mostly on uh, 
um, resensitizing the insulin pathway. However, uh, exactly how metformin is able to do that is still unknown um, up to now, or at least up to 2017 when this paper was published. So in this paper, what um, the researchers did is that they, um, they recruited treatment naive type two diabetes patients and give them placebo versus metformin treatment and then analyzed their microbiota basically here. So you see these, um, the, the, the blue groups are the placebo treated versus the per, uh, pink or purple are the metformin treated. And the number here is treatment length. So the M0, meaning they have been treated for zero a month or no time just at the start. And then when, they, <clears throat> when the patients are treated for two months, the M2 or four months, the M4 group, their microbiota shifted far away from the placebo treated groups, either for zero, two or four months. So among those two group of um, microbiome samples, they can see um, a significant change or enrichment on certain pathways. And in particular, a lot of the metabolic pathways are changed. Uh, one of the interesting metabolites that has been pointed out in the paper is the short chain fatty acids. Um, that we will uh, touch upon again later. And then um, the very interesting or the, the punchline results in this uh, publication is that when the <clears throat> researchers uh, transplanted microbiome um, from the metformin treated patients versus the placebo treated uh, patients, they were able to see among the uh, germ-free mice receiving the metformin treated microbiota they were able to have a higher glucose in, uh, tolerance when they are challenged by the GTT test. And then finally, um, uh, this is a paper looking at um, microbiome versus um, CNS, and in particular, um, microglia and uh, Parkinson's disease. So um, I don't want to belabor into the details. There's a lot of uh, information to, um, to learn from this paper. Um, just briefly, you know, using the, sketch, the scheme from the um, publication, what the paper is trying to show is um, <clears throat> in the mouse model for Parkinson's disease, um, this mouse is basically overexpressing alpha synuclein, uh, which is um, the aggregation of this molecule is correlated with the onset of Parkinson's disease uh, among mouse models. So what happened with these mice is that um, if the mice are given a typical uh, microbiota, there are certain uh, metabolites, in particular the short chain fatty acids, will lead to uh, microglia activation. And this is known to um, increase inflammation in the brain, which will lead to um, Parkinson-like uh, motor deficits. However, if the, you know, a fake uh, microbiota is transplanted or is taken from a germ-free mice, um, this signaling pathway is not in place. And here, there will be minimal amount of um, microglial activation and then there's no motor de deficits. And the most interesting were the, um, the um, most informative um, results from this paper is that when a microbiota from the PD patient is transplanted into this mouse model, the animal actually have an increased uh, accumulation of alpha synuclein and the aggregates of this molecule, <clears throat> which will give a motor uh, impairment when they are tested on some um, behavioral tests. So overall, uh, with all these uh, publications, um, different aspects of microbiome and um, uh, immune or metabolic or uh, central nervous system uh, regulation has been looked at. Um, if, even if we cannot you know, pinpoint on the molecular pathways of how the microbiota has been interacting with these um, organ systems and uh, you know to uh, provide a healthy or disease uh, condition at least 
uh, more and more evidence is point out to how important microbiome research or the uh, microbiota in a healthy human being um, uh, will be able to tell us ab about more how we can treat a disease condition by utilizing the knowledge we can gain from studying uh, the microbiome. So finally, I'm gonna introduce some of the mouse models and services that um, uh, Gem Huang Tech will be happy to provide to you um, in serving your research. So here um, I grouped um, the topics into two parts, uh, mouse models as well as research services. So within the uh, mouse models, we have a field um, commercialized um, germ-free animal uh, that are available on the shelf. And uh, we also are able to generate new germ-free animal uh, given your research interest. Uh, we can do germ-free derivation um, to make uh, the existing model to become germ-free. In addition, we also have um, the germ, uh, the gem uh, customization platform, which um, we can produce a novel new uh, genetically engineered mouse model within our pipeline. And once this new model is generated, we can derive that to become a new germ-free um, mouse model for your gene of interest. Uh, within the part of uh, research services, um, we are able to do fecal uh, microbiota transplantation and uh, as well as uh, microbial coloniz uh, colonization. We can do defined flora or even like mono colonization depending on the need. Uh, we also have uh, the services um, giving animal antibiotic treatment um, so that they can become uh, a, a good recipient for a microbiome of choice. And finally, as we talk about, you know, new germ-free models or new germ-free on top of a novel gem model, we are also um, capable of doing strain phenotyping to characterize the new model for your research. Um, so here is the um, existing or established uh, germ-free mice that we have at Gen Pharmatech, starting from you know, B6 or Bob ICR, as well as our um, severely immune deficient uh, mouse strain. Um, and here, this is, a, this is a, like a, um, the same as the NCG mice. However, um, because of uh, the fact that if NCG if we want to use, use NCG mice for um, a human immune system re reconstitution using the HSC cells, we have to irradiate the mice in order to uh, remove their um, progenitor cells. I, so because of that, not everybody can do irradiation uh, using the mice. So we generated the NCGX, which is basically capable of of receiving HSC without irradiation. And this animal has been very successful uh, as the recipient of human engraftment and for later on um, uh, support the immune therapy research. And finally, uh, the IL-10 uh, knockout animal, uh, which uh, are germ-free, they are excellent models to study diseases like uh, colitis or um, inflammatory bowel disease. So again, um, showing you the picture uh, where we are housing uh, our germ-free facility. So in addition to the um, breeding rooms uh, that I have told you about um, when I introduced the germ-free production pipeline, we also have four procedure rooms, which is configured very similar to the breeding rooms. Uh, but on top of the breeding um, design, we also have uh, procedure space in this facility where we can do GF derivation. Um, we have been able to do that with cesarean uh, section as well as embryo transfer. Uh, we can also do fecal microbiota transplantation, microbial colonization, as well as antibiotic treatment, as I've told you. And finally, the phenotyping and our custom uh, research uh, services um, 
given customer request. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I want to introduce an experiment we did. Uh, well, not really, our R&D research team has done, where they did fecal microbiota transplantation to the GF mice or to a antibiotic treated uh, group of mice. And then they looked at um, the recovery or the replenishment of the microbiota within these two group uh, of recipient animals and looked at some um, common parameters uh, to look to, um, in order to answer the question, how a GF mice um, situation is compared to antibiotic treated animal, which one uh, will give more convenience or um, increased benefit to the research itself. So in this slide, I summarized the experimental design. So basically the GF mice is receiving um, B6 uh, microbiota, uh, which was raised in the SPF situation. And the transplantation was done by a single oral gavage of the fecal resuspension. And we have three mice in each treatment group. And we analyzed uh, microbiota uh, at 2, 6, 14, 21 days post transplantation. Among the antibiotic treated in mice, they received um, B6 as well as DIO uh, fecal microbiome. And we have one donor in each uh, condition. Um, so these mice, since they need to be uh, treated with antibiotics, we used a combination of four antibiotics for the treatment. And the treatment is delivered as oral gavage as well. Plus, uh, in the remaining of the two weeks of the uh, antibiotic treatment, um, the mice received antibiotics in their drinking water as well. Uh, similar to the germ-free mice, their fecal transplantation was done through a single gavage. And uh, we have three mice uh, in each group. And the data was analyzed at um, post uh, day seven, 14, and 56. And there's a reason for the 56, which you will see uh, momentarily. So this is the data um, showing the um, recolonization of the germ-free mice after they received um, um, the fecal microbiota. So here in this graph, this is basically a principal component analysis, uh, which gives a good um, visual perception of how the sample are different from one another or any of the samples will cluster. If they do, they cluster, meaning they are very similar to each other. So I wanna draw your attention to the color coding. Basically the red is the germ-free animal. They don't have any microbiota, so they are here. However, once they receive microbiota at, uh, this is post day two, and then post day six, 14 and 21, the recipient microbiome become very similar to the fecal microbiota. This is the donor fecal microbiota. Um, so the clustering of the day six, 14, 21, close to the donor, uh, is suggesting that in the germ-free animals at about day six, the microbiome um, replenishment has been near complete. And from day two, is already shifted to very close uh, to the donor. So this is photographed in this one, which, um, you know, changing um, the perception um, into a different wheel. So the y-axis is showing uh, how diverse the microbiota is from each sample. And this is a germ-free free situation. This is the donor situation. And this is the recipient, the germ-free mice, after two days, six days, 14 days, and 21 days uh, after the transplantation. So now, uh, in comparison, uh, antibiotic-treated animals, and again, similar to the PC um, plot I showed you um, just before, the antibiotic treated animal, these are the black dots. They are quite separated from any of the um, recipient as well as the donor, which is shown in this um, brown color. And um, again, I want to draw your attention to the color coding. So each color represents um, the 
uh, microbiome that the recipient mice received. The red is the DIO uh, microbiota, the green is the B6, um, and then in comparison, we put the blue, a PBS treated group here. So you won't be able to really see those um, numbers. However, this shows from day seven to day 14 and to day 56. And uh, if you follow the line of each color, you're gonna see the progression of microbiota replenishment and how it progresses to be close to the donor situation, meaning they are more and more resemblance to the donor microbiome as time goes by. And again, just to replot this uh, in a different way. Uh, so each of the microbiota uh, is represented by a color, but in this way, this is the uh, DIO microbiome. This is the B6 microbiome when, uh, when it's taken from the donor. And then the recipient mice, when they receive the DIO, post seven day, post 14 and post 55. And then this is a B6 uh, microbiota among the recipients. And finally, the blue uh, is the microbiota, what well, is the treatment, the PBS control for the treatment. So basically, as you can see, if you remember the germ-free mice uh, receiving a B6 microbiota, um, the replenishment, uh, the time re required for the replenishment is much longer in the antibiotic treated animals. At the same time, even the PBS animal is able to replenish or regrow in this case, their own microbiome. So this actually you know, point out to one of the potentially biggest risk for using antibiotic treated animals. However, um, this is something um, I'm not saying we shouldn't use such animals. However, it just, depending on the uh, experiments, depending on the design and the goal, um, we may have to take into account um, the possibility of this happening. Um, so just to summarize, uh, in comparison, you know, using a germ-free mice versus using a antibiotic-treated mice, um, in our hands, um, we see a clear advantage of using the germ-free mice because uh, there's no pretreatment required and uh, they are capable to receive uh, a very defined um, donor flora and, um, and also the overall experimental timeline is shorter. At the same time, they do have um, a disadvantage, which is they're more expensive, a lot more. They also, they do require specialized equipment, techniques and training among the animal care staff um, they also, you know, for each one of the new GEMS models, it will require a brand new uh, GF derivation. And uh, uh, we have learned from the introduction of this webinar, the physiological condition, um, there's some uh, certain parameters that are different between the germ-free versus the conventional or the SPF animal. Um, on the other side, with the antibiotic treated animals, they are much, um, um, cheaper to use or affordable uh, in terms of cost. Um, they don't require anything special. Um, they are, they are also applicable to any type of animal, whether it's wild type or a novel uh, um, engineered mice. At the same time, um, they may have incomplete removal of the recipient microbiota, uh, depending on you know, the antibiotic treatment regime that you want to use and they have a potential risk of you know, remaining microbiome or microbes in the, in the animal. And also there are certain impacts from the antibiotics or the treatments to the recipient animal. And uh, because of this um, uh, experimental manipulation, the treatment group um, typically show a higher variation with, uh, in between of uh, experimental animals. So um, before I close for the day, I just want to um, mention this last point, which is, you know, uh, animals are um, from our facility, and is um, if you um, buy animals from us, definitely the you know the shipping is a big consideration for the germ-free uh, animal. 
So in our practice, we have, um, we have been using three types of uh, shipping equipment. The first one is um, um, a steel, a stainless steel uh, apparatus, which has a capacity of housing three mice uh, per container. And uh, they have been used for domestic shipping by air quite a bit. And uh, we, we verified they're very um, uh, reliable to use in our hands and then keeping the germ-free uh, status, no problem. The second one is a new addition to our capability. Uh, it's a shipper uh, sleeve. Basically, instead of using a heavy stainless steel, uh, we are using plastic in this uh, case. So it's lighter and the cost is lower. At the same time, it's able to ship about 10 to 15 miles at a time. And finally, uh, we have been uh, developing a transportation isolator which is uh, similar to a uh, isolator raising the germ-free mice, but these are geared uh, towards transportation. So they have some uh, additional accessory add-on, <clears throat> for example, to control the air and uh, to provide accessibility in case, um, you know, uh, accessing the animals required during the two to three days transportation. Um, this isolator, because of the size and, uh, volume is being used by land uh, and probably not um, so easy uh, for uh, tra transportation by air. And finally, I wanna say, uh, this is a <clears throat> outcome from our R&D uh, team's effort in um, serving our customers. And it does, um, the team does apply for a patent in China. Um, so, uh, I was, um, uh, I feel the obligation to tell or to disclaim the ZL here, although they are the same as my first and last initial, uh, nothing to do with this patent and with the effort that the team has been um, put into this effort. And, uh, but I was very flattered to see that um, my initials are a part of the Chinese patent that we have gained. So this concludes my, um, a presentation to you. Um, so I, I just want to summarize in a couple of words, which is, you know, we have these uh, animals and services available. We are looking forward to, you know, work with you. At the same time, uh, similar to other uh, products and services or new uh, products that we have introduced to you, uh, we look for collaboration. So if you have new ideas and new initiatives, that um, you're looking for help and support um, in um, supporting your research, we are always here uh, and happy to talk to you. And finally, just a slide um, in how you can contact us and uh, going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ying. That was a great talk. It was like me going to a Michelin star restaurant and there you have a seven course dinner and you started with starters hors d'oeuvres talked about application you moved to main course so you talk about protein vegetables you talked about metabolism then you had a main course on immunology it was all great and for dessert we talked about shipping wide in new application I, I cannot believe it it was a great talk thank you very much um it was very comprehensive uh, in terms of our services in microbiome uh, work. Um, I like to remind the audience this is just one of our platforms and we have many platforms in depth like this across Gem Pharma Tech, um, uh, for example, conditional knockouts, humanized mice and so forth. But let's stay with Jing's uh, menu and let's talk about um, some of the questions that we've been raised. One of the questions I know you touched upon this Jing is that about international shipping, how efficient is it and how safe um, is it? One of them asked. Mm -hmm. So international shipping, as I um, pointed out, I think the, the shipper sleeve is the most optimized way uh, for shipping animals. Um, so, you know, depending on the size of the order, uh, one or two or maybe a few more are required. Uh, however, um, I think in terms of reliability, um, this shipper has been designed uh, in a way that is quite reliable. And to be honest, we actually 
had um, not only our R&D team to put in the effort in the design and secure the design, we also had input from experts who, uh, who are really good uh, or professionalized in making the uh, germ-free shipper uh, using plastics. So we are pretty, we are very confident in, you know, these shippers are good for international shipping. Our team actually did mock shipping uh, with these shippers uh, and then tested uh, using, you know, the three different ways of testing uh, I've shown to you, and um, they are able to produce, to provide germ-free and sustain the germ-free condition uh, through the testing. Fantastic. We've got two more questions. Uh, they're quite similar. The first one is, can you combine disease models with um, the microbiome germ-free mice? Yeah, well, to that, um, I've touched on that. I think it's um, very uh, possible, as le at least within the gem pharmatech uh, pipeline capability, uh, we are able to produce new uh, gems uh, for customer. We are also able to you know, convert them or make them germ-free uh, as they are produced from the model generation pipeline. And at the same time, um, if customer has their own new gem model, which is novel, um, we are able to help you to um, um, produce the germ-free version uh, of your uh, genetically engineered mice. Great, thank you. And I, I want to also add the point that we have the ability to do preclinical efficacy studies as well in these disease models um, and microbiome. Um, and another question is, can, um, uh, can, can, can Gen Pharma Tech do uh, microbial flora transplantation? Yeah, we can. You know, uh, as I showed you, um, well, I guess this, because I talked about fecal micro microbiome transplantation. So I'm guessing this question is probably talking about model uh, micro microbe uh, colonization or maybe multiple microbe um, colonization. Yes, we can do that. We actually have the um, um, defined flora also in our pipeline. We use the standardized uh, SF, SSF for uh, generating um, um, colonies with defined flora uh, from germ-free mice. And uh, I just didn't have time or uh, to present data from this group of mice today, but you can contact us you know, through the phone number and email here, and we can talk in more detail afterwards. Fantastic. Um, so thank you very much, um, Zheng. It was a great um, presentation. Again, everyone contact us at globalservice at gempharmatech.com. We have the chef, the master, Zheng, always available here to help you. I'm here as well, and the team is here to help you uh, across the globe. Um, so please do contact us wherever you are. Have a nice day. Have a nice evening. And we hope to see you next time on our webinar series. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pradeep. And thanks everybody for coming.